Hello friends, my name is Hannah and welcome to my monthly wrap up for May. Oh, did I have plans for May? Oh, it's my birthday month, Books Unbound, the podcast which if you're not listening to, you should. We're doing Mashed Potato May, which the short version of that is reading books that you're really excited about that have been sat on your bookshelves for ages and I was down for that and let me just tell you I have not had a great reading month. I'm sorry. I've not like disliked what I've read. I just feel like I haven't really read much and I feel like I don't have tons to say. But I'm gonna say it anyway. Sorry about it. Um, I'm gonna start by talking about the audiobooks I listen to. I, I, I read nine books this month. Now I know for some people, like, that might be a lot of books. It might be not a lot of books. We all read different speeds. It's only a couple books less a month than I would normally read. I think my issue is that like four of them have been audiobooks. And so I don't like feel like I, and audiobooks are reading. They're absolutely reading. Um, but like, I feel like I've got a really small stack of books to talk to you about. And it makes me a bit sad, but never mind. So we'll start with the audiobooks and then we'll get on to the other titles because to be fair, you'll, if you have been on my channel before and have seen any of my recent vlogs, you will probably have heard me talk about these books anyway. So audiobooks first. And then if you've already heard me talk about the others, you can fuck off early and no hard feelings. Um, the first audiobook I listened to was The House of Many Ways by Diana Wynne-Jones narrated by Kristen Atherton. This is the third book in Diana Wynne Jones's um, Howl's Moving Castle series, which is a middle grade series. I am not a person who reads a lot of middle grade. Um, I think this is one of the only middle grade books I've read as an adult, but oh, I really like them. I really like them. Um, so I'd never read them before. I hadn't read them as a kid. Um, and someone recommended, one of my friends, I think it was my friend Pippa, recommended Howl's Moving Castle to me way back when I first started this channel back in October. And I had a lovely time with it. Really warm, gentle, cosy kind of fantasy. Um, I really like the magic system in, in the world. And I loved Howl's Moving Castle. I didn't love the second one, Castle in the Air, but that's because it was like a whole new cast of characters and I wasn't expecting that. Um, and the original characters do make an appearance, but it's right towards the end and I was just a bit disappointed because you know when you like really love a set of characters and then they're not in the subsequent books or they're barely in the subsequent books. So I had a little like wobble with book two, but then in book three, because I knew that that is what the setup was going to be, that it wasn't going to be the, pro it probably wasn't going to be the same characters, but that the OG family, Howl, etc. Um, were going to appear later on, then that, I think, I therefore enjoyed this one a lot more. I also really liked the protagonist whose name I cannot remember because this was the first book I read in May, and what is my handle? Hannah lost the plot. And why is that my handle? Brain like a sieve. Um, can't remember the characters. Had a lovely time. The... I did have to make notes this time. Because, uh, <laughs> I should say, as well as feeling... I think part of the reason I feel like I've not had a good reading month is like, May is a really, really busy work time for me. And it's also been like a busy lifetime. So I feel like my reading has been really sporadic and like crammed into like little pockets of when I could manage to read something. And that for someone who already struggles to um, retain information, <laughs> this is just not the best. So I did have to make some notes to, to help me remember some of these, uh, some of these books because straight up, if I tried to do this without, without notes, I would, it would be a very, very short video indeed. Um, so, the second book I read was Drive Your Plough Over the Bones of the Dead by Olga Tokarczuk, which uh, was translated and narrated 
by Antonia Lloyd-Jones. So I was really excited for this for a couple of reasons. Firstly, again, if you've been on my channel for a little while, you'll know I'm having a bit of a Polish moment. I've, 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 been, I've been to Poland twice in the last year um, and I had intended to originally um, listen to this audiobook when I was in Gdansk in March um, and then just didn't quite, didn't quite get there. Um, but also, as luck would happen, Jen Campbell's Patreon book club, book club pick for spring was this book. So I was like, ah, oh, perfect. Now is definitely the time to read it. And let me tell you what the book's about. And I'll tell you how I felt about it. So the book follows um, a woman called Janina who is living in this very remote part of Poland, um, kind of right out close to the Czech border and it's it's winter and you get the impression that in the summertime it's kind of like a touristy spot and people have second homes there but then in the off season there's really not many people around so it's got this kind of like deserted sleepy town vibe going to it which I was really into. Um, Janina is a very interesting woman. She um, She sort of in the off season looks after the home, like the second homes of the people who don't actually live in the uh, in the area and she's very into astrology and um, she is a school teacher who is working on like Polish translations of um, William, Bi uh, William Blake's poetry and there's like loads going on with her. She's a very interesting woman, fascinating woman. Um, and very early on in the book, her neighbour, who she calls Bigfoot, it's kind of like her thing, she doesn't um, use anyone's actual name. She kind of gives everyone a name that is just kind of like how she vibes with them, I guess. So her neighbour, Bigfoot, um, is found dead. And no one knows what has happened. Um, it, it is a suspicious death. Um, and it is not the first death in the book. So it sets off this chain reaction of other deaths occurring in this village. And plot ensues. So it's a really interesting literary sort of slow burn, unreliable narrator crime book. That is essentially what it is. And there was so much in there that I found really, really interesting. I, like I said, I think she was a really interesting character. Um, I think the writing style, obviously writing style is hard in translated fiction, but I enjoyed the writing style of it. Um, and I know all the talk chick is, you know, she's a Nobel Prize winning author um, and incredibly well respected. This is the first book of hers that I've read and I can really see why she's got that status. I think for me, the problem with this book was format. Um, I think I would have really liked this book if I'd been reading a physical copy of it. Unfortunately, I really didn't vibe with Anto uh, Antonia Lloyd-Jones narration style. I think you could tell she wasn't an actor and it was quite monotonous and quite like stilted and for a book that's already quite slow you really like doing audiobooks is a real real skill and it's also incredibly subjective like some people I'm sure would get on absolutely fine with the uh with the narration, but it really wasn't working for me. And actually, I think it was a mistake for me to persevere with the audiobook. I wish I had stopped and like gone to the library and got a physical copy of this book and read that instead, because I think I missed loads. I think this book was probably doing really clever stuff and I wasn't getting it because I was really struggling to stay engaged with um, the audio. So that was a bit of a shame, but I definitely think I like Olga Tokarczuk's writing. Um, and so I, I would really like to read more of her 
stuff in the future. But yeah, that one was a bit of a, a bit of a miss. But like I said, different format, possibly different story. The next book uh, I listened to on audio was Matrix by Lauren Groff. And that was narrated by a Joa Ando. And I really liked the narration of this book. It was one of the things I liked most about it. Um, so this is a um, historical fiction book uh, set in the kind of 12th century. And it is a fictional reimagining of um, the life of a real person, Marie de France, who I had never heard of. Um, but she was a woman uh, from the 12th century who had, she was a poet and she'd, um, I think she's credited with doing some kind of French Norman, like whatever the 12th century French. Um, she's credited with doing like that translation of like the Aesop's fables and things like that. So she's, she's this woman who was writing in the 12th century that alone was quite interesting, but we don't really know anything about her. Her name isn't even, we don't even know actually who she is. Um, so, as a as a kind of um, reimagining of a of a real person's life, I think Lauren Groff was able to be really creative with that because we really don't know that much about her. So the book begins with Marie, who is um, she's in the French court, but she's like an illegitimate daughter. Um, and she is getting cast out by the Queen of France and being, she's been sent to basically go be a nun in England. Um, so things have got a little sour. Uh, I didn't really pick up on why, but I don't really think it matters. Um, because the book basically starts with her arriving at, um, at this abbey in England uh, when she's 17. And Marie is really interesting. She's this very like physically strong, impressive presence. She's really tall, um, really kind of big woman. And uh, she doesn't fit into the stereotypical boxes that people think she should fit into. And she's, um, she's really, really interesting. And she comes from this line of sort of slightly mystical warrior women. There's this cool kind of like folklore thing happening with her. Um, and the book basically follows her life uh, from when she arrives at the Abbey through to sort of eventually being in charge of the Abbey and um, sort of reinventing the way they do things and being incredibly uh, quite controversial, but really kind of forward thinking. Um, she also has a number of uh, sapphic romances along the way, which is lovely. Um, and like, I enjoyed it. I liked the writing style. As I said, I thought the narration was good. But for me, I think the structure didn't quite work because it's her and the, the audio book I think is like eight hours so not super long and it covered her entire life from like age 17 all the way through until she's like really really quite elderly and for me it was too fast and I felt like obviously we, we grow and develop a lot as people over our lives right and it felt sometimes like sometimes like she wasn't developing at all and sometimes like she developed in this way really, really quickly because we weren't kind of able to sit in it. So I thought it was interesting, um, liked it, here for it, didn't love it. So then the fourth and final audiobook I listened to this month was We Are The Weather by Jonathan Safran Foer, which was read by Jonathan Safran Foer. And, um, I really, really liked this. So this is a non-fiction book. Um, and it's the first non-fiction of his that I've read. I have read a couple of his novels in the past and really enjoyed them both. Um, and I was really looking forward to seeing what his non-fiction is because I know he writes a lot in the sort of climate 
space and that is very much um where this book sits too but it did it sort of talked about climate breakdown in a really interesting way and its perspective was very interesting so it wasn't sort of it's not a science book it's not um it's not about climate breakdown it's more about people and this sort of psychological dissonance that we have where most people most people understand on a kind of intellectual logical level that climate breakdown is a real thing and it is happening and most people know and understand that our actions as individuals and on mass as uh, on a kind of like social and international levels um are literally making it worse and yet most of us don't really want to change our lives in any significant way in order to lessen our impact now and that's not and what he's basically saying in the book is like he's not He's not criticizing people for that. He's, I mean, no, he's not. He's not criticizing people. He's pointing out that it's really interesting that there's loads of us who do that, who kind of, and I, I definitely put myself in in this in this camp too. Um, I did give up eating meat and then went vegan, largely for environmental reasons. However. Um, I definitely know I could be doing more. I should, I, you know, we have a car and we shouldn't have a car and we're flying in planes and we shouldn't be flying in planes and all that stuff because there's this like distance between knowing something. This is what he largely talks about in the book. The distance between knowing something and really believing it um, and sort of being con really confronted with it. Um, and he he kind of talks about it's really interesting so he's like if you imagine um into the future 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 generations who's gonna come off worse in hindsight right the people who didn't believe climate change was happening and therefore didn't act on it or the people who did believe it was happening and didn't do anything about it. Because one of those things is ignorant and the other one is kind of worse, right? Because we know. <laughs> um, so it was, it was really interesting. And, and, and I, I don't want to sort of, I don't want to put people off reading the book um, if that sounds like, if it sounds like you're gonna get a bashing because it's so interesting the way he comes at it because he basically is talking about this really personally like with his own journey to sort of try and grapple with this thing that we on on mass as a species we seem really really not able to do <laughs> on the whole like some people are amazing at it and like hats off to you but most of us are in this kind of area where we're like what but also, um, so he's, he's coming at it from a very humble place. I think that's, that's what I, I want to say. And, you know, he talks about how he kind of objectively knows that he should probably give up meat, but he finds it really hard. And he, he's not like, he's not able to give up me he's not he's not done that he's done it mostly, but not quite. Um, and so it's really, really interesting, but also he, um, he draws from really interesting sort of um, different parts of human history that sort of look at a similar kind of psychology. So he has this anecdote where he talks about, I cannot remember the name of either of the people involved, but essentially there was, a, there was a, a Polish man during World War II who escaped out of the ghettos in Poland and made it all the way to America and went to this judge who was Jewish and, and said, this is what is happening. You need to, you need 
to, to help. This is what is happening. This is what the Nazis are doing. Um, and the judge basically said, I don't think you're lying to me, but I cannot believe you. And, and it's space, it's, it's kind of the same thing, right? We know it's happening, but we can't quite believe it. Um, it's not quite honest enough yet to really, you know, we don't not believe it, but we can't believe it. Um, and yeah, I just thought it was, but there's loads of examples like that of like different things. It's, it's a sort of, um, a really social exploration. It kind of looks at lots of different aspects of society. It looks at suicide. It looks at the war, as I've said, it, it looks at agriculture and all these different kind of things. And I think he is brilliant at exploring and pulling together and connecting dots. I think that is his real gift as a writer. And then he has this bit at, towards the end of the book where he is imagining you know, because the, the consequence of climate breakdown isn't that the planet's going to like explode or die, right? It's just that we will no longer be able to live here. Um, and so he imagines a world where, you know, millennia in the future, the Earth's still here, obviously. And he imagines whatever other kind of life form has evolved at that point on, on this planet kind of finding pieces of us and, and sort of trying to to get a picture of um who we were as a species based on um what is left of us in the earth and it is art it was it was gutting absolutely gutting but beautiful and kind of heartwarming and also incredibly like <sighs> but just Read this book, honestly, it's so good. Read it, read it, read it. Um, so those are my audiobooks. Those are my audiobooks. So I can put this down now. Um, because the thing with audiobooks is they're not physically here to remind me. Uh, so that's why we need the notes. Um, so then I have five books to talk to you about. Um, none of which I'm going to talk about for very long for various reasons. Firstly, one is a book I read for work, which if you've been here before, you know these crop up every so often. Um, I work in education, I read a lot of educational books for my job. Um, and this is from Hood to, should we go this way? We'll go this way. Uh, from Hood to Headship, uh, A Black Woman's Journey to Becoming a Head Teacher by Miriam Manderson. Miriam is wonderful. Um, she is... <laughs> A black female head teacher. Uh, she's head teacher of a brilliant school in North London, and um, we did some work with Miriam recently, which was why I, I read this. So I do know her in real life, and she really is wonderful. Um, and this is sort of, as it sounds, her journey to becoming a head teacher. Um, and it has not been a, a particularly easy, um, easy journey. Uh, there are not a lot of people um, like Miriam in headship, um, not a lot of black women leaders, but also specifically from the sorts of backgrounds, i.e. inner city London, um, like where she is from. And she kind of talks about that and how that has been um, throughout her career. The book itself, I will be honest, it is pulled together from her blog um and so it does as a as sometimes when memoirs are kind of like pulled together from you know kind of other pieces of writing or even sometimes you know with like essay collections where it can feel like slightly repetitive and then lack a little bit of structural coherence there's definitely that but Miriam's ace and you know yay uh so there is that and then way back at the start of May I filmed a reading vlog where I read The Promise by Damon Galgit. So um, this is a Booker Backlist title. It won the Booker in 2021. And I read it because I am doing the Storygraph Read the World Challenge. And this was the book I picked up for South Africa. Um, I liked this book. It is a sort of unfolding family saga. Um, this family who have a property just outside Pretoria and um, on the mother, the mother dies towards right at the beginning of the book actually and makes a promise on her deathbed that um, 
the domestic worker, the black uh, woman whose name I cannot remember. Da -da 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 -da. Salome um, has uh, so Salome works in works in the house. She's a black woman, and the mother gets the father to promise on her deathbed that she is going that Salome is going to be given the deeds, the title deeds to the property that she lives in, like on this. She's got like a house on their land and the mother wants Salome to have that. That is the promise. Um, and as this is a book that has many pages in it, it may not surprise you that that doesn't happen straight away. And so it is, um, it sort of looks at the fallout of that promise not being kept, uh, throughout the, the family's history. So you follow different members of um, that family over kind of 10 year time jumps. So it starts with the daughter and then it jumps 10 years in the future and then it's their dad and then it's 10 years of the... It was good, I liked it. It's very bookery. Um, and there were a few bits, again, I, you can re if you wanna know more, you can watch the vlog, I'll, I'll link it down below. Um, it, he's a great writer, he really is, he's got a beautiful turn of phrase and there were lots of bits where I felt really, like, I was like, oh, beautiful sentence, lovely sentence. But on a whole, I really felt at a distance from this book. I felt like I didn't ever really get into the characters. They were all pretty unlikable which again like I don't have to like a character to enjoy reading about them but um I struggled a bit with this one he also did this thing with the uh with the narrative voice where it was almost always third person and then would sometimes just like flip into second and sometimes I think flip into first and it was really like jarring and odd and I think it was to kind of pull you in a little bit but I just found it a bit even more distancing but yeah so it, it wasn't a resounding success so there you go you can't be bothered to watch that vlog there's the Cliff Notes version um and then I have three books that I read in another vlog so again I will not kind of talk about these two extensively because if you want to know my more in-depth thoughts you can you can watch those vlogs linked below um but I have made a little jar, actually this, this little jar here, um, of <laughs> prompts for my reading, because uh, I'm trying to read all of these unread books, all of these are unread, um, and I'm planning on doing that by doing some themed reading vlogs. So I did the very first one of those, which was wholesome books. The prompt actually read, I just want to have a lovely wholesome time. And on the whole, with these three books, I did have a lovely wholesome time. So first up, there was, uh, yeah, we're gonna stay over here. A Psalm for the Wild Built by Becky Chambers. This is a sort of solar punk, I have been told since originally reading this book. It is a solar punk book, um, but it's sort of um, set in a far-flung future where at some point in history, um, robots uh, who were being used extensively as sort of we are starting to use them extensively um, they became conscious it was called the awakening all of a sudden they kind of all of the um, all of the kind of robots became alive and that obviously changed the way that humans and robots interacted and it ended up um, being that all of the robots kind of went out into the wider world and the humans stayed in these kind of uh, in these cities and the robots went off into the wilderness to kind of go and be by themselves and we follow um, a monk uh, called Sibling Dex um, who is having a bit of a quarter life crisis, doesn't really know what their purpose is, not really sure what to do with their life. I mean they're a monk so they've already kind of decided what they're doing but then they decide that they're going to go off and explore the wilderness um, they've become very fixated on the idea of hearing crickets in the real life in the real like world um and so they set off on this uh journey with their little kind of tea hut wagon thing 
um, and they encounter a robot out in the wild. Um, and essentially this book is a series of meditative kind of conversations between the monk and the robot. I really liked it. I thought it was very cozy. It, it is um, like the kind of philosophical questioning is like really at the fore in this book. So um, if that's not something you enjoy, then this might not be for you. It's very slow moving. Um, and it is a lot of sibling decks and the robot talking to each other um, and kind of thinking thoughts, big and small, um, which I really don't mind. I really don't mind in a book, but um, it's not for everyone. This also has um, a gender representation, which is not um, a queer representation that you see tons of. So yay for that. Um, so there was that and then the second book I read in the vlog is another one that I loved um, and this was many different kinds of love and I'm gonna have the same problem that I always have with these foiled covers there we go many different kinds of love by Michael Rosen I'm gonna stop holding up because it's gonna annoy me how much that's glinting um, but this is uh, Michael Rosen is a poet children's author as I'm sure you may know um, and he was very, very ill with COVID right early on in the pandemic. He was hospitalized um, and put in an induced coma. And this book is a mixture of his, well, it's essentially his sort of, he lost two months, nearly two months of his life. Maybe nearly three months. No, I think like two months of his life. Um, when he was really really poorly and when he was in this coma and he's sort of trying to process that and so this book is largely told in poems it's um a series of untitled poems kind of in different sections it moves chronologically from when he, he first got ill all the way through to kind of his recovery um but it's interspersed with his patient diary which is something that was kept um by the people who were taking care of him there uh, healthcare professionals who were taking care of him uh, while he was in the coma um, and they would write like little notes like uh, let me see if I can find you some so um, here's just one that I've got to randomly uh, dear Michael my name is Beth and I've been the nurse looking after you overnight Thursday the 16th I normally work at Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital looking after children but have been moved here to help look after adults I call you guys big children You've done really well overnight. You're starting to move little bits, which is excellent. Hope you continue this great progress. You've got this. Looking forward to meeting you when you wake up. You f you read my favorite. You read my favorite book. We're going on a bear hunt. All the best, Beth. I didn't do a great job of reading that. Sorry, Beth. But um, but yeah. So it's got loads of those in as as well. And ah, uh, I but I I loved this. I just loved it. Um, and I, I cannot recommend it enough. Um, it's a kind of ode to the health service, but it's also, it's not overly sentimental about it. Like some, Michael Rosen is angry in this. Like he is really angry. He is angry for himself that this happened to him. He is angry about the political choices uh, that were made, particularly in the early days of the pandemic. And yes, yeah, so it is excellent and I will definitely be rereading it. And then finally, the third book I read in that vlog and the last book I read this month, last month, uh, was Infamous by Lex Croucher. Now this was a different kind of wholesome uh, and it was a real departure for me. If you've been on my channel for a, a while, you will not have seen many books like this crop up. It is a queer historical kind of romance and romance is really not something that I read a lot of it's generally not something I gravitate towards if I'm gonna read romance I would always prefer it to be queer romance because it just it feels a bit less cliched um no shade on romance writers and no shade on you if you like romance I just uh, I'm too repressed for it man I can't cope um but this was great I loved it um it follows a 22 year old Eddie Miller and her best friend Rose and uh, they get caught up in this, um, Eddie wants to be a writer. She reminds me a lot of Jo March from Little Women. 
Um, she wants to be a writer and she's desperate to make that dream come true. And sometimes when she's pursuing that, she's a little bit selfish. And um, she kind of gets swept up by this Lord Byron-esque poet called Nash Nicholson, uh, who then brings her on lots of kind of japes and adventures. And then things turn sour and it's it's really good. It's just really, it was like a lovely little holiday for my brain. It was like zippy and zingy and zoomy. <laughs> Wasn't that zoomy, but I just really wanted another Z word. Um, but yeah, I, I really liked it and I, I really recommended it. Uh, if you, uh, if you're a romance fan, um, if you're a YA fan, I think, I think you would like this, but if you're not, like I'm generally not, you may also really like it. Uh, so there we go. That is everything I've read in May. Um, I really hope I have a better reading month next month. It's Pride Month next month. So I say next month, it's June now. I'm recording this in June. So it's Pride Month now. And I have already read more books in June at this point than I than I had in May so I'm already feeling like I'm having a better month and uh I've got some exciting stuff planned so if you don't want to miss out on that and you've enjoyed this video and you're still here um please do like and subscribe to my channel that would be lovely let me know um in the comments down below what the best things you read in May were if you've read any of these let me know if you've had a good reading month, if you've had a bad reading month, if you've had an okay reading month. I just wanna know, cause I'm nosy. Um, and yeah, I will catch you again soon for something else. Bye.